If you're watching this on YouTube, you might have noticed that this episode is a week delayed. But if you want to get early access to our episodes, consider becoming a paying member. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with your friends. Thank you for all your support. Well, Stephen, I find myself somewhat in awe, both as one of the world's most distinguished scientists, but also a physicist, where physics is in some sense a sort of senior science. I mean, the, the bedrock of all other sciences. I'm a mere biologist. I suppose biology has the complexity, but physics has the fundamentals. Of course, we physicists feel that way, but we're much too polite to say so. <laughs> yes. Um, it has been said that uh, whereas most um, distinguished scientists tend not to be religious believers, um, there's a slight tendency for biologists to be even more atheistic I've than physicists. That, yes. You have heard that. Do you, what do you make of that, if anything? Oh, I don't know. Perhaps it's just that biologists have bloodied their knuckles so much fighting over evolution that they've become a little bit more militant. And um, I think physicists perhaps tend to, um, since they hope that they're approaching some ultimate understanding of the laws of nature, uh, they tend to use God as a metaphor for that. Einstein famously did. Uh, Hawking has, um, without necessarily meaning very much by it. Um, That's been all, always my impression, that, that, that most physicists who say they're religious, if you actually probe a bit deeper, it turns out that they're religious in the Einsteinian sense. Yes. Um, but you, you pro probably know some genuinely, I mean, genuinely Christian or genuinely Jewish who really, really do believe... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I know a, a number of general relativists for some reason, people who work in Einstein's general theory of relativity, uh, who are devoutly religious. Uh, I don't know why that in particular. I knew uh, one astrophysicist who said he was an Orthodox Jew, but didn't believe in God. Yes. I mean, nobody ever says they're an Orthodox Christian, but we don't believe in God. <laughs> but that, I mean, because Judaism puts so much more of an emphasis on uh, observance as compared to belief that it makes sense in a way. I think Hinduism, in that sense, is like Judaism, that what's much more important is the dietary rules and the keeping various Sabbaths and holidays. Uh, you're honoring a tradition... And in Judaism, nobody ever catechizes you about what you believe. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, obviously many of my friends are Jewish, and uh, I've asked them what they understand about the afterlife, and they don't have the foggiest idea. Yeah. It's not part of the official religion to have a definite idea about yes. the afterlife. I mean, I think it's very also, different from Christianity. Yes, and I think also in Judaism there's a, a tradition of Continual questioning, isn't there? Continuing sort of examining and turning your beliefs over and... I suppose so, yeah. yes. The Talmudic tradition. Um, of course, Christianity is more like Islam in that way. It's really important that you believe in specific things and um, you're likely to get killed by someone if you don't believe the right thing. Particularly someone of almost the, the same religion. Yeah, that's but, right. That's but right. Uh, but not, not quite. Um, the... Whenever I'm asked sort of what's the most convincing evidence you could think of, if which would really convince you that there is some kind of a supernatural being, uh, I think once upon a time, uh, say in the time of William Paley, uh, biology was, 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 was it, because mm. the, the, the prodigious complexity of life, the beauty of it, the, the, um, the sheer intricacy and the stunning illusion of design which living things... Uh, project. Paley himself said, said um, I think something like, um, the heavenly bodies are not best fitted to demonstrate the existence of the creator. You know, it, it, I, I think that's just an accident of the time that Paley lived, uh, because at that time, the physical scientists had done a good job of explaining the solar system, um, although there were still things that were not well understood. But you know, you go back earlier, everything seemed to require a divine explanation. Even Newton uh, thought that um, although he could account for the way the planets moved um, and the tides and the fall of fruits, um, he could not account for the fact that there was a difference between dark matter and light matter. 
uh, between the sun and the planets. And in a letter to Bentley, he uh, said that that was the sort of thing that required divine um, intervention to explain why the sun shone and the planets did not. Nevertheless, the eye as the instrument that sees things with sunlight, uh, surely Newton would have regarded that as even more of an evidence of the divine, wouldn't he? I, I don't know. I don't know. Ever, I don't know that he ever speculated about that. He had great hopes for a unification of all the sciences in terms of various forces acting on corpuscles of matter. Uh, I don't know how far he went in, in thinking of, that that would apply to living things. That's an interesting question. I, doubtless Newton scholars could tell us, but I don't, I don't know the answer. Yes. But it, it's, um, it's true that uh, by the early 19th century, uh, when Paley wrote, uh, the outstanding problem that seemed to require a divine explanation was the problem of life. And... Um, I believe Cardinal Manning, at least this is what I learned from Lytton Strachey's biography of him, uh, Cardinal Manning uh, became a de devout Christian by reading Paley's book. He was so convinced. Well, Darwin himself was. I mean, Darwin yeah. himself read Paley as an undergraduate oh, at, I didn't know at that. Cambridge. Uh, well, they all had to, but Darwin yeah. was particularly impressed by it and, and uh, I think on The Voyage of the Beagle he probably thought that what he was seeing when he roam through the Brazilian jungle and things was, was evidence of, of um, God. But although it's often said that it was Darwin who finally killed that kind of pa paleism, and I think that's probably right, nevertheless, even before Darwin came along, it, it's never seemed to me to be a very logically co coherent argument. I could have imagined, indeed, as David Hume did, that before Darwin came along, one would have said, well, I don't understand where this illusion of design comes from, but a supernatural designer doesn't help. We're still left with a, with a, with a mystery. Mm. Uh, and so, although it's very nice that Darwin did come along and actually answer the question, even before Darwin came along, we didn't actually, so to speak, need him in order to reject the idea of a supernatural designer. We physicists are somewhat in that position because we hope for a... Uh set of very simple laws of nature that will account for everything we see. But when we have them, there will always be a question, well, why those laws? Exactly. And many people say, in fact, a, a Jesuit has argued to me that that's where God comes in, that God ordained the laws and he is the ultimate explanation. And of course, the, the response to that is, well, you know, what, uh, have you really helped at all with that? Uh, what explains God? Uh, what explains why God is the way God is? Uh, if, you, if you have some specific understanding of that three-letter word, G-O-D, uh, then you have the mystery, why is God that way rather than some other way? And if you don't have any specific understanding of what you mean by, I hear the thunder, I hope he's not getting annoyed with it. Uh, <laughs> If you don't have any uh, specific understanding of what you mean by G-O-D, uh, then what are you talking about? Yes, quite. <laughs> then, it, then it's just an empty word. I suppose a biologist would put an additional spin on that, which is not just why is God this way rather than that way, but in order to do what he's supposed to be doing, which is, say, ordaining the laws of physics, to say nothing of forgiving our sins and listening mm -hmm. to our prayers and things, he would have to be... A complex entity, which is exactly the kind of entity that we are setting out to explain, and which Darwin, in fact, does explain. And so, in a way, um, Darwinian, the Darwinian theory raises our consciousness to the fact that any god worthy of the name would have to be much more yeah. complicated than an eye or a brain or a, or a heart. And therefore, particularly... Uh, I love this, this is really great, uh, p particularly demanding of just the kind of explanation which he purports to provide. Yes, once in the, just to change the subject for a moment, uh, once in a debate about this sort of thing, uh, someone in the audience said, uh, uh, your view of that there isn't any God is not falsifiable. And I said, yes, it is falsifiable. A bolt of lightning can come down. <laughs> 
and strike me dead on, and then it would, my view would be falsified. Yeah. And I suppose listening to the thunder yeah, uh, reminds me of that. But going back to what we were saying, yes, uh, 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 it's, it's a little bit like the explanations the, uh, the Greeks were satisfied. You know, Aristotle explained falling bodies by saying they're going to their natural place, which is toward the, toward the center of the earth. Well, when you say that, you really haven't learned anything more about falling bodies. It hasn't helped you to say that. And in the same way, talking about a God who is compl- complex and created the world the way it is, you haven't learned anything. It doesn't help you to anticipate anything you'll discover That's in right. nature. But I don't think one should underestimate uh, the fix we're in, that in the end, we will not be able to explain uh, the world, that uh, we will have some laws of, some set of laws of nature. We will not be able to derive them on the ground simply of mathematical consistency, because we can already think of mathematically consistent laws that don't describe the world as we know it. And we will always be left with a um, question, why are the laws of nature what they are rather than some other laws? And uh, I I don't see any way out of that. And I, I just regard it as just another one of the tragedies that we have to get used to, uh, like the tragedy that we will die and the tragedy, well, I don't want to uh, linger on tragedy, but uh, I think essentially the position of human beings is a tragic one. Uh, And the more we understand, the more clearly tragic it is. And um, part of it, which particularly affects a physicist, is the tragedy of never being able to come to a really satisfying conclusion of our questions, why. And uh, you know, what do we do in, in, in this tragedy? I think, uh, well, Shakespeare showed us that one way of living with tragedy is to mix it in with comedy. Yes, yes. And um, uh, we can have, we can take a certain amusement at our, position, always seeking why, 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 never coming to the end. Um, I think humor is one of the leavening agents that uh, makes our tr- the tragedy of our position uh, possible. Uh, the Greeks, in writing their plays, didn't understand that, that you could mix comedy and tragedy. Yeah. There, there's no comedy in, in Sophocles. Um, uh, but Shakespeare understood, and I think that's what's so great about Shakespeare. I think Shakespeare. that's right. I mean, I, I mean, moving to, the, to another level, I, I love the comic novels of Douglas Adams. Uh, have you read any of his? No. Hitch- oh, well, I think you might like them because he uses comedy, mm-hmm. but in a, a rather sophisticated scientific way. And so, and so his jokes will, would really appeal to a, a modern physicist who, who understands... Well, I've heard uh, of the one, you know, what is the... The secret of everything, it's 43 or... No, no, yeah, they're, they're, they're much, much better than that. I mean, no, um, I can't well, think never of any of that. No. I, you, might, you, you, you might enjoy it. But going back to the, to the tragedy of never finally understanding, I mean, you're making pretty good progress working your way back through the first three minutes and, mm-hmm. and getting, where, where are you now, to the first picosecond or, oh, or it's, something? It's, I, I, we don't... I mean, if our present... There's so many powers of 10 that I, I don't even know what English word to apply to yes. it. But uh, I mean, we certainly uh, uh, can directly observe the universe as it was when it was 380,000 years old. That's the microwave radiation that uh, comes to us uh, essentially undisturbed from that time. And that's been a great success story in cosmology, the detailed analysis of this radiation that fills the universe. And it's not quite uniform everywhere. It's the non-uniformities that are so interesting. Um, and so important for what happened later, of course. Yes, yeah. well, they, that, they are the non-uniformities that ultimately grew into uh, the proto-galaxies and then galaxies and then clusters of galaxies and uh, allowed us to, to arise. Um, but looking back earlier than the first 380,000 years old, we, we have theories, and the theories work. In fact, uh, uh, some of our theories that describe what happened when the universe was three minutes old 
uh, tell us the chemical composition with which the stars started. And that, that works too. I mean, the predictions come out right. Uh, there's a certain amount of hydrogen, a certain amount of helium, a certain amount of certain rare isotopes of hydrogen and helium, helium-3 and hydrogen-2, that uh, we can calculate the amounts, and that's what we observe in the oldest stars. So that actually, uh, more accurately, that's what we observe in uh, the intergalactic material out of which the stars form. Uh, so in terms of things we can actually observe, I suppose you could say we've traced the history of the universe back to the first three minutes. Um, earlier than that, it's just pure theory, except that the, these non-uniformities in the microwave radiation, which are so important, which we're studying with radio telescopes, and which we believe, and have every reason to believe, grew into the distribution of matter we see in the sky, these non-uniformities we, we believe we have a theory for their origin in terms of a pre-Big Bang phase called the period of inflation. And it works. That is, it, it predicts certain properties. For example, the, the strength of the fluctuations as a function of how large they are. Um, what's the probability of seeing a fluctuation this big as compared to one that big? Uh, that theory works, and it deals with a period of time which is incredibly uh, early in the history of the universe, so, much, so early that you really begin to wonder whether there really was a beginning or, or should you even talk about a beginning. I mean, it's so... I, I don't even know how to say how early it is, but it's, it's way earlier than the first hundred... 380,000 years or the first three minutes, it's, uh, it's an incredibly small fraction of a second after the beginning. And that, those theories seem to work. But, you know, that's only going back so far. Then you, you have to go back to what started inflation, what started this inflationary period. And we have theories. Uh, there are some attractive theories, but they can't be tested. We don't have any observational handle on them. Even without an observational handle, however, if you've got a theory which is even plausible, I'd be grateful for that. Uh, well, there is a theory of chaotic uh, inflation uh, due to Andre Linde at Stanford that um, there are certain fields, uh, they're the kind of fields we encounter in our modern theories of elementary particle physics. They're known technically as scalar fields that fill the universe, and essentially they, they're chaotic at the beginning. They're, one does not impose any particular initial condition on the universe. Uh, it's just as complicated as you can imagine, which is a nice uh, beginning because you don't have to fine-tune any initial conditions. And uh, this burbles on, and it... it the, you have fluctuations which are continually increasing and decreasing. It's all very complicated. Every once in a while, uh, surely by accident, a patch of this fluctuating field become, happens to become smooth. That is, it, it doesn't vary much over a sufficiently large region of space, just by accident, not by any design. That region you can show according to a reasonable dynamical assumptions, will then blow up, will inflate, will increase in size exponentially, becoming smoother and smoother, turning into the inflationary phase, which we think preceded our Big Bang. But this didn't just happen once. It happened again and again, and perhaps time without end. And uh, our Big Bang that we are, that, that is all we can observe directly, that is 13.7 billion years old, and we now know that number to 1%. <laughs> um, that Big Bang is just one episode in a chaotic universe, which is always burping off these Big Bangs. So does that mean there are lots of universes then? There are a lot, well, 
what we call a universe, our Big Bang, there are lots of them. I mean, I guess for linguistic purity, one should reserve the word universe for, for the whole for, thing, uh, the yes, whole okay. shebang. Okay. And uh, talk about each of our Big Bangs as a sub-universe. But very often people refer to each Big Bang as a universe, and then they use the term multiverse, multiverse yes. for the whole thing. And yes. I think it's, it's, erupt. it's up to you what language you use. Uh, the multiverse idea has some very attractive features. I mean, it arose out of thinking of infl theories of inflation. Uh, but it has had interesting byproducts because if this idea is correct, and we don't yet know, it's, it, at this point it's just a speculation, but if this idea is correct, there's every reason to expect that in the different big bangs that occur, you will have different conditions, different values for what we call the fundamental constants. And uh, so that the fact that the constants of nature are suitable for life, which is clearly true, we observe, uh, may, not be, um, may not be a universal fact. It may just be an accident, just as the fact that the temperature of the Earth is suitable for life is not true of planets in no. general. We, obviously, we have to be on a planet. We have which to is... be on a planet in which the temperature is suitable. I don't know exactly what the range is. Most people think water has to be liquid. We could argue about that. It doesn't but, leave very much range. I mean, yeah, it, no. It, it, maybe, perhaps life could arise in liquid methane, but clearly there are some limits. I don't think life can arise at one degree Kelvin. Yeah. I don't think it can arise at 100,000 degrees Kelvin. So yeah. there's some range of, of temperatures in which life can arise. And it's only, as you say, it's only on the planets that happen to be in that fortunate position. Or in the universes that happen to be. In. And, and then this, this is... Uh, then carried over by analogy into, the, um, into our universe, that it's only in those big bangs where the t values of the constants are suitable uh, where life can arise. In other words, um, if there was... You know, I don't think there's really any evidence for a very precise fine-tuning of the constants of nature. Well, that's interesting, because some physicists seem to think there is extremely... I know, I've argued about that. Yes. Uh, what, one of the examples that is often quoted is a certain energy level of carbon, of the carbon nucleus. Uh, if it was 10% higher or 10% lower, then the nuclear reactions that build up oxygen from carbon and stars wouldn't work. This and, was Fred Hoyle's argument, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. well, it, Fred Hoyle was the one who realized there had to be this energy yes. level and that nuclear synthesis wouldn't work well without it. Well, the... F the fact that there is such an energy level that just that energy does not require a fine-tuning of the... I think, and I've argued with people about this, I don't think it requires a fine-tuning of the um, constants of nature because that state of the carbon nucleus um, is essentially a, a, a bound state of a beryllium-8... I'm getting very technical, beryllium-8 nucleus and a, high, and a helium nucleus. And that's just the condition that you need in order to allow nuclear synthesis to occur. So even if you change the constants of nature, the value of the energy of this state would change, but it would still okay. be a better state be, of beryllium-8 plus okay. an alpha yeah. particle plus a helium nucleus. Yes. And so it wouldn't make much difference as far as nuclear synthesis. Yes. There is one constant that seems to be fantastically fine-tuned. But we don't, again, we're not sure. And that is the constant called the dark energy, the, uh, or the vacuum energy, or the cosmological constant. This is the energy in space itself, not associated with any particles or, or radiation, but just an energy, so many calories per quart of space, everywhere in the universe, whether there's matter there or not. Uh, the uh, amount of this has been measured. It's been observed that it's not zero. It has a small, finite value. Uh, to give an idea of the value, it's, it's about the amount of, in a volume the size of the Earth, uh, whether the Earth is there or not, just in that volume of space, the amount of energy is the energy in a few hundred barrels of petroleum. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, not a lot. Mm -hmm for a volume the size of the Earth. That energy is detected by its effect on the expansion of the universe. 
it's causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate. And that, that's something that was discovered 10 years ago by two different pairs, two different teams of astronomers studying the, uh, the speed and distance of distant galaxies. Um, this, now, we, can, we try to calculate what this energy is from first principles. Uh, there are various reasons why we can't calculate, but we can calculate certain contributions to it. For example, we can say fluctuations in the electromagnetic field, just due to the quantum nature of radiation, uh, not down to arbitrarily small wavelengths, because we don't understand anything at very, very short distances, but just down to the shortest distances at which we think we understand physics, which is roughly a hundredth the size of an atomic nucleus. Those are the shortest distances that have been probed in our accelerators. So counting the fluctuations in the electromagnetic field or the gravitational field or any other field down to the shortest distances that we have probed, the energy that we can, we can calculate what energy that gives space, and it comes out to about 56 orders of magnitude larger than the observed value. Um, that is a one with 56 yeah. zeros. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it could, well, you just have to shrug your shoulders and say, well, there are the other contributions we can't calculate, like the contributions from fluctuations with even shorter wavelengths. They clearly cancel. But it's a, it's a pretty accurate cancellation. It's a cancellation to achieve. that's accurate to yep. 56 decimal places. Yes. And that has us disturbed. And uh, there are, uh, I mean, it's possible that that will be explained in a way that has nothing to do with the multiverse. Uh, it may be that for some fundamental physics reason that we don't know, uh, the universe is evolving toward a state where that. Vacuum energy, that dark energy, is exactly zero. And it's small now just because the universe is old. And it's not far from that final state. No one has constructed a theory in which that's true. I mean, it's not only a speculation. The theory would be speculative, but we don't have a theory in which that speculation is mathematically realized. Yeah. Yeah. So it, but it's a possibility. Uh, but the only other explanation, well, it's not even an explanation because we don't have a candidate theory, but the only explanation that seems to work is that um, this is just one of those things that varies from sub-universe to sub-universe, from Big Bang to Big Bang. In most of the Big Bangs, it's very large. It's much larger than what we observe. And in those Big Bangs, they go through, because... This energy drives the expansion of the universe, depending on whether it's positive or negative. The universe either blows up so rapidly there's no time for galaxies or stars to form, or it crunches, it recollapses so rapidly, again, there's, there's no, no time, time. Yeah. for life to form. Yes. So it has to be small for life to exist, uh, and it's about as small as it as. In fact, that's interesting. It's not much smaller than it would have to be to allow life to arise. And the fact that the cancellation is so precise means that the number of universes in the multiverse you need to postulate in order to anthropically mm -hmm. be comfortable with it is very, very large. And it must be at least 10 to the 56, or, yes, or in fact, exactly. uh, yeah. if you think you have some idea about fluctuations at even shorter distances, I think you would say at least 10 to the 120. Uh, in fact, that... That's a little disturbing, but it, it, a completely separate development, not motivated by this at all, has taken place recently in, in string theory. Uh, string theory, you know, is our best hope for a theory unifying all the forces of nature, gravity and all the other forces, all the particles. It's the most... Um, it's been a little disappointing that it hasn't led to any specific breakthrough in understanding what we already know. But it's still, it's the best game in town, the best hope we have for a really fundamental understanding. It was realized a number of years ago, largely through the work of Edward Witten, uh, that what had seemed to be about half a dozen different possible string theories was really only one string theory, that there's, there's just one string theory uh, 
which, but it manifests itself in many ways. And in fact, not in half a dozen different ways, but the solutions of string theory are incredibly numerous. And in fact, uh, the estimate that people usually quote, although it's, it's highly uh, approximate, is something like 10 to the 500 solutions of string theory. And these solutions fill out what's, what string theorists call a landscape. And uh, each one of them may represent a possible kind of Big Bang. Now, again, this is very speculative uh, because we don't understand string theory at, uh, a really, at the deep level that we need to understand it. But this has already upset some uh, religious leaders. Uh, Cardinal Schönborn, the car- the I know, Cardinal I know his name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of, well, you've had problems with him with yeah. regard to evolution. Yeah, yeah. He wrote an op-ed article in the Times a few years ago in which he... Um, he attacked the neo-Darwinian synthesis. Is that the right word? Yeah. 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 And um, he attacked the idea of evolution without design, but he also attacked the multiverse idea. Yes. And that did my heart good to see that because, you know, you evolutionary biologists get all the fun of being <laughs> attacked by religious zealots. And here, Cardinal Schonborn at least knew enough about cosmology to realize we were worth attacking. Um, well, I'm glad you enjoy it. I, I must say, I don't mind either. I, <laughs> no, I mean, isn't it better than being ignored? Yes. Uh, there are teachers of biology in this country who tell me that they are intimidated. They don't dare teach these contentious subjects. And I find that hard to understand because I should have thought it would be more interesting to teach her something controversial. But they're frightened of being, I, I don't know, attacked by parents or by uh, Maybe the children themselves sometimes. Well, uh, yes. I mean, uh, the, uh, I think there are school boards that are very backward. Uh, I've, I testified in front of the uh, Texas uh, State Board of Education. Which is particularly influential because of textbooks. Y- yes, for some that's reason. right. Yes. It, it's, at that point, uh, they were honestly confused. They really thought that uh, intelligent design was an alternate scientific theory, and why not present both mm, scientific mm, theories? And mm. uh, they were not anti-science. They, uh, they thought it was science. They thought it was science, yeah. and they were, I think, I think they, their mind was changed by scientists coming before them and telling them, no, it's not science, it's, it's chicory pokery. Um, I mean, the myth has been assiduously... Yeah. promulgated this, no, this, this it has. science That's and they've right. been taken in by it. Uh, I mean, there are people who are uh, much more uh, difficult to deal with than, than I found the Texas Board of Education. And I think, and we won that argument. Now it's coming up again in Texas. Um, I think this is beginning to be a problem in Europe. Yes. And I understand it's very much a problem in the Islamic world. Yes. That there's a strong prejudice against teaching Yes. The theory of evolution. Yes, there. that's true. In fact, perhaps of teaching basic science at all. Uh, the Islamic world uh, took a turn away from science sometime in the 12th or 13th century, which is really quite tragic. Uh, Given their rather good role oh, yeah. in, in the, the, uh, preserving Greek science before. There's a lovely line in uh, Philip Hitty's book about the Arabs uh, he's talking about the great period of the House of Wisdom in Baghdad at the time of Caliphs Harun al-Rashid and al-Mamun. And um, he said, while uh, al-Rashid and al-Mamun were studying Greek and Persian philosophy, um, Charlemagne and his lords were dabbling in the art of writing their names. <laughs> yes, that's right. Very good, very good. And coming back to the to the alleged fine tuning of the universe, um, I was interested in one of the things you saw. Well, in many things, but um, I've always tried to explain it uh, as an amateur because I'm not a physicist. Um, having accepted the the word of physicist that there is a, an element of fine tuning, and I've tried to lay out three possible explanations. One one would be God, which, as I've said, isn't an explanation at all. One would be um, the um, 
multiverse and yes. then anthropically with hindsight saying we have to be sitting in one of the universes right. that could give us. But the third one, which I've attributed to you, oh, no. possibly wrongly, oh, no. uh, would be um, I, what I call the macho physicists who say, well, uh, it's just that we don't understand um, uh, why these things that are, the, are the way they are. One day we will, uh, it, when, when we have a theory of everything... It, it will be understood, but it sounds from our conversation as though that I, I misrepresented you there. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I really am not impressed with the amount of fine-tuning there is, with the exception of this one, one the, the dark energy. Dark, yes. That might... I mean, and that, you can say qualitatively, the amount of dark energy now is comparable to the amount of energy in matter now. It's a few times larger, but it's not very different. Maybe there will be an explanation for that, and, and uh, in, a fundamental explanation. Uh, people have aimed at, at that sort of thing. Stephen Hawking, for instance, has. Um, so I think it's fair to say we don't know. If you discovered a really impressive fine-tuning, that uh, if you change some otherwise arbitrary parameter, numerical quantity, by 1% in either direction, life would become impossible. And that was just a free constant in your theory. It could have any value. Uh, then I think you would really uh, be left with only the two other explanations, either a benevolent designer or a multiverse. But the benevolent designer we, we, we know can't work because it, it begs the question that you've raised. So that leaves us with a multiverse, doesn't it? Uh, well, it doesn't solve the problem, but it opens up the realm of possible speculation um, in a way that I can't even imagine thinking. But it, it changes the nature of the game. Uh, but the multiverse would be really an explanation then. A very satisfying. I mean, I've heard it said that physicists somehow think it's cheating, but, but I think it's rather elegant. I think it's rather beautiful. Uh, well, we've had to live with this before. You know, uh, there was a time when it was thought that the distances of the planets from the sun were dictated by geometrical principles. Kepler yes. had a theory yes. like that, although it was only the ratios of the distances. And it was somewhat of a disappointment to learn with Newton's theory that we were never going to have a fundamental theory of... Um, the distances of planets from the stars. I mean, each planet is the distance it is because of a historical accidents that can't... When will we ever be able to explain precisely why the Earth is 93 million miles from the sun? No, clearly, it's, we're not going to be able to do that. The only explanation is a rather fuzzy anthropic one, which allows for it to be 92 or 94 million miles from the sun. Uh, the... Uh, the difference between that and the multiverse is, of course, we can see that there are lots of planets. I mean, we, can, uh, we have only discovered a few dozen planets in this universe, but our theories tell us they're, they're vast numbers because most, a large fraction of stars seem to have planets. So the existence of the other planets is no longer a, a speculation. Well, the existence of the other Big Bangs is a pure speculation right now, but it may not always be. But it, uh, it's not the case that the existence of the other Big Bangs we postulate only for anthropic reasons. No. I mean, you no. have other reasons for That's right. That, in yeah. fact, Cardinal Schönborn, in his op-ed article, said precisely that the multiverse idea was invented in order to avoid the appearance of design in the universe. Yeah. And that's simply that, that's not, not true. true. It's historically not true. Yes. OK, right. Now, going back to the planets, which is a much easier case, of course, um, I've, I think you can turn this argument quite interestingly on its head and point out that it, since there are obviously going to be probably billions and billions of billions of planets, um, if, which is perfectly possible, only one of them has life, because we know no, nothing else than that, then we would have to say that our theories of the origin of life, in our theories of the origin of life, we are looking for a chemical event which has to be quite staggeringly improbable. Uh, 
because otherwise we would expect the universe to be teeming with life. Well, you're the biologist. You would know better than I do. How improbable do you think it is? That, that's a quite separate question, and, and it's an interesting question. But what I'm saying is that the statistical argument allows us to postulate an event which would be so improbable that we would ordinarily call it impossible, uh, because it only has to happen once. Uh, yes. And with hindsight, we have to be on, the, on that planet. Right. I mean, the our existence tells us nothing about how probable it is for life to arise, given the right conditions. Uh, even the fact, uh, apparently we know now that life arose rather early in that, the history that, of that the That helps Earth. a bit. That's an additional but fact. But even that doesn't help very much, because suppose life had a... Had a Arisen on Earth, uh, not when it did, but 100 million years later, still very early, as the Earth goes. The Earth is four and a half billion years old, but still very early. Well, that means evolution would now be 100 million years behind, behind. behind schedule, mm -hmm. behind mm -hmm. schedule. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would not be here talking about it. Yeah. And uh, so the condition, well, I don't know, does it take... Uh, no. Uh, a two billion years for intelligent life to arise uh, once life starts? Perhaps it po does. Possibly. Uh, um, I mean, may maybe it takes that long to get a eukaryotic cell. However, I don't think there is a schedule once you get out to... I mean, it's, it's not clear why the dinosaurs didn't produce intelligent life. They might well have done, in which case it would have, would have happened uh, at least 65 yeah. million years earlier. So I, I don't think you can say that, that it took... Uh, as you say, two billion years from the origin of the eukaryotic cell in order to get intelligent life. I think it could have happened much earlier than that, or, or indeed much later. But so I, I think that's an accident. I can't believe that something like that worm that all the biologists study, C. elegans, which has about 100 neurons in its nervous system, yeah. I don't think that could ever... Oh, no, no, no. Uh, but uh, I mean, that, I think, that's a multi-celled organism with yes, a nervous system, yes. but it, it, it no, still is not going to learn quantum there's mechanics. No, there's, there's no timetable in the sense that um, 65 million years after the dinosaurs went extinct, only then had evolution no. kind of breasted the tape yeah. of, of it. It could have happened 10 million years earlier or 10 million years later. Or well, it, it may be that uh, we're on the, the tail of the Gaussian that is... Uh, it's very improbable that life arose as early as we did, uh, as it did after the formation of eukaryotic cells. And if that's true, then there's a strong selection that it's only uh, life that arises very early in the history of the universe that has a chance of becoming intelligent. That has time before... Yeah. before the, so the, yeah. And if that's true, and we don't know that it is, but if that's true, then the fact that life arose very early on Earth does not argue that life arises readily whenever the conditions are right. Uh, it might be that it's still an incredibly unlikely thing and... Uh, it's only on the doubly rare cases where it arises very early that uh, it then becomes intelligent. Yes. And, of course, we don't know how rare life is. It could be very common. I think we pretty much know that intelligent life is, is rare because otherwise we'd have been visited by radio uh, transmission. The Fermi argument, where yes, are they? where all? are they? Um, and so I think you have to say that maybe there's a a cascade of improbabilities. There's the origin of life, perhaps the origin of the eukaryotic cell or something like it, and the origin of intelligence and technology. But even... And we've the, got through all those hurdles. Even that, you know, uh, we've sampled... Um, in terms of how long it takes to reach us, we've sampled only a few tens of thousands of light years, even because, assuming people can travel at the speed of light. Yes. Um, or that they send us signals... Uh, so we've, we've perhaps sampled a volume of our galaxy. It's a pretty small sphere, 10, isn't it? 10,000 light years, but yeah. it's only one galaxy. And yes. There are billions of galaxies. Yeah. Uh, so it may be that life maybe occurs a few times in each galaxy. I would have thought, uh, yes, I mean, yeah. And, and, mm. and then it's still quite uh, frequent. Um, well, it's, it, wouldn't it be exciting if... Uh, signs of a completely independent uh, life were found, even on Earth. I mean, it might be that you, one could find organisms that had a different genetic code. Well, Paul Davis is actively looking for this.
It would only take a different genetic code. I mean, because we, as far as we know, the DNA code is universal. Mm -hmm. the minor, minor details. Yeah. But a different genetic code, either not based on DNA or based on even based on DNA with completely different lookup table. Yeah. Are, there's nothing very at attractive or elegant or efficient about the genetic code we have. No, I mean, Francis Crick devised a much better one. Yeah, uh, which, I heard which, that. Yes, yeah. yeah what which, a pity. Yes, what a pity. That, uh, that's right. Uh, the, uh, you know, I'm quite an opponent of manned spaceflight, uh, not because I think it's bad in itself, but just it's incredibly expensive and it's sold as a way of doing science, and I don't think it is a good way of doing science. No. Um, I think space flight, uh, unmanned missions are very important. I'd like to see lots of unmanned missions to Mars, scooping up soil and examining it. But I must say, if they discovered something on Mars that required human inspection to decide whether it really was a sign of life, that would change my mind about... Wouldn't it be space. staggering? Wouldn't it be yeah. amazing? Yeah. But uh, I don't see that happening. Yeah. And I don't see why we would want to send a very limited number of humans to Mars examining just very small no. regions of the surface rather than hundreds of robots. Yeah, that's pure, all over the that's surface. public relations, isn't it? That's, that's, oh, that's, it's, there's some kind of mystique about putting yeah. people into space. Uh, I've argued about it and uh, uh, most astronomers, I think, would agree with me. Yes. Most aer aeronautical engineers or whatever they are disagree. They love the idea of it's a challenge, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. And what, of course, politicians love it. What about talking about big science? I mean, presumably you're excitedly looking forward to what CERN starts to produce. Uh, uh, with a certain amount of terror that, uh, you know, they may discover great things like the particles that make up dark matter, or they might discover signs of supersymmetry. Uh, they probably will discover the so-called Higgs boson, uh, which in the theory of Salam and myself, is responsible for the breakdown of the symmetry between the weak and the electromagnetic forces. But um, uh, it may be that they'll only discover the Higgs boson and nothing else. And we'll be left um, looking at our toes and <laughs> wondering what are we going to do next? You know, uh, there may be nothing exciting really new that can be reached with the Large Hadron. But it project. was worth doing, nevertheless. Oh, well, we have to find out. And, of course, yeah. there's a good chance that they're going to discover something very exciting. But uh, I have fears that, uh, my, in a way, it's less frightening if they don't discover the Higgs boson, because that would be a contradiction of our good theories. And then we would all go back to the drawing boards. And we have various alternative theories that might explain that. Uh, and it would be exciting for a while. But if all they discover is a, uh, a Higgs boson with roughly the properties that the theory predicts and nothing else, uh, I, I, don't I see know what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Uh, nevertheless, wouldn't you say to a young person, now would be a very exciting time to go into physics because of this. I mean, in Britain, they're moving away from physical oh, no. science Britain in droves. Cut it, it's not only cut its support for this, it's cut its support for uh, a number of uh, telescopes and mm. other things. It's cut its support for the next linear collider. Yes. Uh, no, it's kept its support, I think, for CERN. Uh, I think that Britain yes. has maintained its support for CERN, which is the laboratory where the Large Hadron Collider uh, will be placed. Uh, well, I would say that anyone who goes into physics right now would be a little bit too late to participate in, in the work of the LHC. And uh, whether or not it would be a good career move depends on what they're going to discover. I think I'm the thinking LHC. of theoretical physics, that, that, that depending upon what they discover, mightn't there be a sort of opening of Yes, damn if, walls. If of, they of, discover uh, something exciting, yes. then, then by all means. But if all they discover is the Higgs boson, yes, uh, and it has the properties we expect, then no, I would say that uh, the theorists are going to be very glum. Right. Um, a moment ago, you, you mentioned um, Abdus Salam. Yeah. Uh, 
Can I ask, was, was he one of those who was a genuinely religious? I mean, I've heard it said he was a devout Muslim, and I've always wondered about well, that. Well, when I first met him, I visited Imperial College in the academic year 61, 62. He had a bottle of scotch in his desk drawer. Yes. So he was... He, was, he wasn't an observant Muslim. He wasn't completely observant. No. He was religious, and as the years went by, he, had, he gave up alcohol. Uh, but he, was, he belonged to a sect, the Amidai, uh, I think that's what it's called, I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly, that has been officially declared heretic in Pakistan, his home country. And as a result, for many years, he wasn't allowed back into Pakistan. Uh, but he was quite religious about that. I mean, uh, you know, I regard all religion with a, a certain sense of bemusement, and the Amadai sect seemed even a little bit more peculiar than the other branches of Islam, but uh, he was quite serious about it. He had two wives, uh, one of whom uh, an Oxford doctor. I know her, yes. And the other is a very conventional uh, Pakistani woman who lives in London, and they both came to the Nobel Prize uh, in 1979, and they alternated... uh, appearances at the uh, <laughs> at the official events uh, he uh, it's in- interesting because although he was quite devout as a Muslim he deplored the anti-scientific attitude that he found in the world of yes. Islam he, he told me that he had tried to get the the states of the Persian Gulf which are very oil rich like Dubai and and so on um, Bahrain uh, he tried to get them uh, to put money into building universities that would uh, include a, a component of basic science. And he said that they were very resistant to that, that they wanted to go into technology. They were enthusiastic mm-hmm. about technology, but they, they, they did not want to do fundamental science because they thought that was um, corrosive to religious belief. Probably rightly so. Yes, I, yeah. I suspect they're but right. But he didn't think that then. He didn't think it was no, progressive. No, no, no. His point of view was that of many well-meaning physicists I know in America who think, oh, there's no problem. You, science, religion can happily coexist. Yes. I think, in fact, um, uh, although it's a slow process and there are many exceptions, that in the long run, uh, science is eating the lunch of religion. Yeah, I think so too. And that uh, we already have seen a great weakening of, of religious belief. Uh, it's obvious in Europe. I think it's also true in America. I, th- I think Americans believe in religion um, on the average. They believe that religion is good for you. And uh, they... Uh, but but when you ask them what do they actually believe about the afterlife or about how do you how are you saved, they're likely to tell you, you know, well, it isn't so important what you believe. The important thing is to good live a good life. Yes, I've yeah. heard that so yeah. many times. Me too. Yeah. So I think the um, the you know if I really cared about religion and I looked at the state of religion in America, I think I would cry over it. it it's religion is. A mile wide and an inch deep. It, it yeah. doesn't go very far. It doesn't make me cry. It makes me laugh. But we, yeah. we, we're running out of time. Um, so can, can we resume after? I began by saying I felt humble as a biologist. And one of the reasons is the sheer mysteriousness of physics, which I suppose is nowhere more true than in fundamental particle physics. Uh, and, but as a biologist, I, I try to come to terms with why it's so hard to understand. And I'm wondering what you think of this, that something about, um, well, natural selection equipped our brains to uh, control medium-sized bodies, which is moving at medium speeds Mm -hmm. um, in roughly two dimensions rather than, well, in three three dimensions. Um, And therefore, things like multidimensionality, things like um, particles mysteriously going through two slits or one, depending upon when anybody's looking at them, uh, and um, the, the slightly less mysterious aspects of, of relativity. Our brains were never equipped to understand that kind of thing because we didn't need to. But if we had, had been denizens of interstellar space travelling at near the speed of light, relatively would be second nature to us. And if we had been 
uh, the size of fundamental particles, we wouldn't find mysterious. Hmm. The things that, that I at least find mysterious. Do you find them mysterious or, or, or do you cope with them in, in your own mind? I think you're exactly right about why they seem mysterious. Uh, we cope with them uh, using mathematics. Um, we uh, have mathematical formulations of quantum mechanics that are perfectly satisfactory. We know how to calculate things. Uh, uh, a course in physics is a series of problems. The student has to learn how to s calculate the energy levels of the hydrogen atom, the, the, the classic problem that um, convinced people that they were on the right track during the development of quantum mechanics. Uh, occasionally, perhaps, we lose our sense of strangeness because the mathematics become so familiar to us. Uh, I think there are things that are... Uh, truly strange, and that uh, even though we can deal with them mathematically, we shouldn't lose the sense of strangeness. Not relativity, uh, which no longer <laughs> seems to me uh, paradoxical or weird, but uh, quantum mechanics is really strange. Uh, the, in the, the interpretation of quantum mechanics that developed in the early 1930s uh, under the leadership of Niels Bohr in Copenhagen, the Copenhagen interpretation, I think is fundamentally flawed. It, it divides the world into physical systems and observers. Yeah. And uh, that can't be right. Observers are parts of the world. They yes. have to be described yes. by the same quantum mechanical language as everything else. Uh, the, the first person who uh, thought seriously about that and tried to develop an alternative way of looking at quantum mechanics was a graduate student at Princeton, uh, Everett. Uh, Hugh Everett. Hugh Everett. Yeah. And, but his solution to the problem uh, is in a way even weirder. Uh, there, there is something called the wave function, which evolves in a completely deterministic way, and it, there is a wave function of the universe which governs everything, including all our observers and their apparatus and the physics journals in which they publish their results. And uh, all of that, all that happens during a measurement and a pub subsequent publication is all described in the evolution of the wave function. But if you, have, if you believe that, then you really have to believe that uh, since in an experiment uh, we can have a, a particle which has neither a definite spin this way or this way, but is a superposition of the two, when the spin is measured, it's either this way or this way, one or the other, with different probabilities, in, you, Everett's, in, in Everett's interpretation, both are realized. The universe splits into a world in which the electron is spinning this way and the observer sees it spinning this way, and another world where it's spinning this way and the observer spinning, sees it spinning that way. And this happens not only in physics buildings, but continually throughout the universe, so that uh, the wave function of the universe is infinitely more complicated than we normally think of the universe itself as being. It contains components for every possible history uh, of, of the things in it. Now, that's so weird that you know, it's, it's hard to... It's hard to think in those yeah. terms. It seems to me to be ever so slightly less weird than the Copenhagen interpretation. Well, I, I, it, it's less weird in the sense that... It's just hideously uneconomical, I yeah. think. Yeah. Well, I would say the Copenhagen interpretation is just hopeless because I, the split between observers and... Mm. I mean, observers can't be different from electrons and yeah. spins and so on. Uh, there is a hope, which I, I nurse but I don't see being realized that eventually we'll find that quantum mechanics as we know it now is just an approximation and that when, uh, when an electron, which is in a superposition of states in which it's spinning this way or this way, when it interacts with some big thing like a physicist, a macroscopic body, 
like a physicist or his, his apparatus. Uh, actually, there is a physical decay of the wave function into a wave function where the electron is purely moving this way or purely moving the other way. And that, um, in fact, the history of the world has not split. There has been an evolution of the wave function, which is not the kind of thing that occurs in quantum mechanics as we know it, uh, but represents a... Um, something that's specific to large bodies. I think uh, some people have thought that perhaps gravitation has something to do with this, that after all, large bodies are the only ones where gravity uh, is important. Gravity is an incredibly weak force on the atomic level. Uh, that would make sense of the whole thing, if that were true. But it requires a modification of quantum mechanics. And there are papers that suggests possible modifications of quantum mechanics. Well, that's a great ways. hope, isn't it? That would be wonderful. I think that's, the, that's mm -hmm. the best hope, that we will find out that quantum mechanics, as we know it, actually breaks down for very large things. Now, it's true that the predictions of quantum mechanics have been verified for electrons that are separated by macroscopic distances. We can verify that there really is what's called an entanglement, that you can have two electrons that are meters away from each other where the physical state is not a state where one is up and the other is down, but one which is a superposition of left up, right down, and left down, right up. So these two particles know about each other. Is yeah, what they, yeah. And um, it's just what you expect quantum mechanically, and it happens over macroscopic distances. But they're still just electrons. They're not big, heavy things with gravitational fields. Mm. So it may be that uh, these experiments that verify quantum mechanics at macroscopic scales uh, don't really settle the argument. Uh, but I... Uh, well, I tell a story in something I wrote, a true story that... Uh, a friend of mine who was a physicist at the University of Texas, who now, incidentally, wound up at Oxford, um, Philip Candilis, uh, was standing next to me waiting for an elevator. And I asked him, whatever happened to so-and-so, mentioning a graduate student who had seemed very promising and then we never heard of again. And Phil nodded his head sadly and said, he tried to understand quantum mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I try and try and try, but um, I never seem to get anywhere. And the amazing thing is that we don't need to, that um, you can live your whole life calculating the energy levels of atoms and molecules and calculating cross-sections for elementary particle reactions, using quantum mechanics every day as part of your intellectual toolkit and, yeah. and never confront these Well, problems. I've met physicists who've said, well, why bother? I mean, the mathematics works, and, and yeah. but that seems to me so unsatisfactory. And, it and, is and, unsatisfactory, yeah. but it's not professionally unsatisfactory. No, I can see that. It's only humanly I can see that. But there's a slight analogy. It's not, nothing like so profound. I think I've heard you say, all right, uh, that many physicists, going back to the God question, Aren't, don't really care. I mean, they don't yeah. think it's an interesting question. I can't quite get that. I mean, it does seem to me that... Uh, I, I don't believe in God, but it does seem to me that uh, you've got to care about it because, because if it's true, it's, it's one the of the most, most important profound thing in the yes, world. Yes. That's right. I agree. Yeah. Um, well, I think the expression I used is that most of my friends in physics uh, don't care enough about religion to qualify as practicing atheists. Yes, uh, they just don't care, and they don't want to think about it. And I do think about it. I try not to think about it too much. I mean, clearly one could let it, it run a, I mean, you could let it run away with you. I've visited organizations of people who are atheists and who gather together for mutual comfort. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, to me, it smells a little bit like a church. Yeah, they're not very edifying, some of those meetings, yeah. are they? Uh, but I mean, they're very well-meaning people, and yes. I, you know, I agree with them. But um, I wouldn't build my life around. No, you go along to give them a bit of moral support, but, but... well, I, they invited me, so yes. I went. But um, uh, and I think maybe you and I have also some slight difference in our um, attitude toward religion, uh, in on the aesthetic level. I. Uh, well, perhaps not, but 
you know, it's been part of our lives for so long. So much oh, of yes. history has been yeah. bound up with it that you you can't not not only be interested in it, but have a kind of respect for it the way you would have respect for someone who you don't particularly like, but who is still very powerful and uh, and has played a large role in your life. I'm not sure the respect is the word I'd use, but but certainly, I mean, when you think of the great music that's been inspired by it, yeah. and, and well, obviously because that's where the money was, I mean, I mean you, you, you get a bit cynical. Well, it's not that. only because that's where the money, there is, I mean, some of it, yes, uh, but some of it seems to have a really religious feeling to it. Um, uh, I don't know about music, but, you know, in poetry, there are poets, um, well, with John Donne, I don't know. I mean, he was such a randy preacher. But, uh, <laughs> but with someone like Herbert or G- Gerard Manley Hopkins, I think there really is a religious inspiration there. I do, too. I mean, I, I and, believe it to be suit too And it, I think giving up religion, we would lose... Gerard Manley I, Hopkins. I agree, and, and I'm sure Hopkins didn't make that much money from it either. Yeah. I mean, well, but we wouldn't lose Shakespeare. There's not a bit of religious inspiration in all no. of Shakespeare. That's right. And that's one of the, I mean, that's, uh, that's considerably more important than Hopkins. Yes. Nevertheless, you can't read Shakespeare without knowing the Bible because, I mean, you can't, you can't take no, your No, you have illusions. to know about it, and he uses yeah. witches, and, yes. and he has Hamlet worrying about sending Claudius' soul to hell, but... There's not the slightest feeling that Shakespeare himself took that very seriously. No, that's right. But I, but I mean, I am in favour of religious education in the sense yeah. of, of education in the Bible and, and I suppose other holy books. Well, and also the, the Greek myths and the, and the Nordic yeah. myths as well, or you can't, um, you can't understand And some Bible. of it is great literature, some of it isn't. I mean, the Bible is a mixed bag. A, uh, a friend of mine who is more learned in these things than I am said it was really an anthology of Hebrew literature. And yes. some of it's good and some of it isn't so good. Uh, well, so in, the, in the King James Version, it, some of it is... is I'm talking about the Old Testament, of course. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I can't read the Hebrew, but, uh, but, but I'm told that, for example, my favourite book, Ecclesiastes, which in, in, the, in the 17th century English is ravishing, mm-hmm. uh, I'm told that in Hebrew it's very good as well. Yeah. And, well, in fact, a, uh, an Israeli told me that the King James Version is closer to the Hebrew Bible than modern English versions because the Hebrew Bible had an archaic flavor when it was written. I see, yes. And uh, and you get more of a feeling of the Hebrew Bible by reading the King James. I remember I went to a a, a Catholic mass and a friend took me to and I went to be friendly. And um, they use that line which in the King James Version is now we see as through a glass Glass, darkly. yes. They translate it into modern English. Yeah. Now we see uh, obscurely, not clearly, or something yes, like that. It's it, was, it was so bad. Hopeless. Yes, yes. Um, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. That's translated as hopeless, hopeless, uh, or something like that. Uh, yeah. uh, just awful. Um, I mean, if, if you really want to kill religion, translate the holy books into, into modern speech, and, and, and that, that'll go a long way. Towards yeah. it, and of course we would. Uh, in architecture, uh, we would lose so much. Those wonderful cathedrals and mosques. Uh, this, I remember how impressed I was with the Al Aqsa Mosque and yes, uh, yes. in Jerusalem. Yeah, you you can't get away from that, and I I wouldn't I wouldn't wish to. But but it's done so much harm. And uh, well, I use this metaphor that it's a crazy old aunt who used to be beautiful it's and quite fond of her. Yeah, and yes. we're fond of her in a way, but yes. it'll still be better when she's gone. Yes. <laughs> I think that's right. I think that's right. What do you think about? Um, but you said I won't re- regret it at all. I won't regret it at all. No, but 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 I I, I get the point. Even yeah. even so. Um, in American education, in, in my own field of, of evolution, it's, it's, there's a very, very serious attempt to subvert science education. That doesn't seem to be happening in physics, or is it? Oh, I don't think it's happening. Uh, I've never heard of anyone attacking the, the teaching of cosmology, but they don't go into it very much in high school. And at the college level, there's no attempt. I mean, I, you're not saying that at the university level there's an attempt to subvert the teaching of evolution. Well, I think, I think so. Is it actually, really? Yes. Oh, I, I wasn't so. aware of that. Uh, I'm, I've, I've known teachers who, uh, in almost every class they teach, there will be a significant minority, not maybe even quite a large minority of students who will 
ostentatiously fold their arms and kind of look defiant when you, when you start yeah. uh, talking um, about... Maybe even walk out. In extreme cases, go and complain to the dean that they've been offended. Uh, their religious beliefs have been offended. One of the uh, things that may help, may work in this direction is that we, I think we over-rely on student evaluations. Yes. Uh, I think um, I mean, student evaluations should not be given very great weight, uh, uh, be precisely, well, partly for this reason, because they provide an uh, incentive for the teacher to teach in an ingratiating, comfortable way. Yes. And, uh, well, I taught a course in, the, course in the history of science. Uh, in fact, I will again in the fall. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went a lot into the interaction of science and religion. And uh, I was sort of hoping that some student would get upset with yes. me <laughs> and that we would have an interesting interaction. But, you know, I'm, I'm at a position where I can, I can live with it. Uh, I think for someone, say, an assistant professor who yes. doesn't have tenure, yeah. yes. it's a serious problem. It's not yeah. a serious problem for me. I was actually looking forward to a, a little uh, Donnybrook. But... Um, it didn't happen. I don't, I don't think I, I offended anyone. I wonder whether somebody of, of, of your clout and prestige might actually just look around and perhaps ask whether there are any junior professors of biology who are having a hard time. Well, that would be interesting. And perhaps you could put, put your weight behind them if, if they are getting in any trouble. Yeah, well, I, uh, the only one people in the biology side here I know are senior professors. Yes. But, uh, that's an interesting question, and I certainly will ask the question mm -hmm. if, uh, if I have a chance. I, I had assumed that the universities, just as, you know, American secondary school education is pretty terrible on the average, American university education is pretty good. And when you get to graduate ed education, it's excellent. Um, I assumed the same was true about academic freedom, that uh, there's a lot of pressures at the high school level much less so for undergraduates and none at all for graduate students. That but may I may be, be wrong about that. Uh, uh, that. That may be. I, I have heard the story about Texas having a particularly disproportionate influence on, on um, textbooks. Oh, yes. Well, that's just economics that for uh, historical reasons, Texas selects its um, textbooks at the, at the high school level, excuse me, at the state level, and um, so it buys a lot of books all in one package. Yes. I, I remember, you know, I, I gave a talk once soon after coming to Texas uh, to a uh, convention of high school science teachers. And they were interested in just this sort of question. And I was talking about how it's important to resist pressures and teach evolution and all this sort of thing. And they sat there. They had heard that before. And then I said, I really didn't see why the question arose, because it seemed to me that every high school teacher should be able to select his or her own textbooks and to, to fit the kind of course that he or she wants to give. At that point, I got a roar of applause and I got a standing ovation, because much more important to them uh, then the question of what they taught is, is their intellectual independence. And they, they really chafed under the system of having prescribed courses with precise, pre prescribed textbooks. Our daughter did not go to a public, well, what we call a public high yeah. school. Mm -hmm. um, she went to uh, the equivalent of an English public school. Um, a private, and, private school. Yeah, Andover. Yeah. Uh, George Bush's old school. <laughs> and um, although she turned out differently. Yes, I'm and, glad to hear that. <laughs> and her, her professors, her teachers, they weren't called professors, her teachers uh, designed their own courses, chose their own textbooks, and they were very much more stimulating courses. I bet they were. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, there is this dirigiste tendency. People attack the idea of government doing things. They say government is, is inefficient, and then they do their best to make it inefficient by yeah. forcing it to behave mm -hmm. in a bureaucratic, mm -hmm. uniform way. Everyone has to use the same textbooks. Um, I think people should be much more relaxed about 
people, even though they're employed by the government, doing things in the same kind of uh, freewheeling way that you do in private business. And every once in a while, a taxpayer's dollar will be wasted. But I bet the taxpayer will get better value for their dollar that way than under the present system. Thank you very much. It's been a great privilege. Enjoyed it. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, you can show some support by subscribing to the podcast, sharing it with your friends, and leaving a review.